Okay, guys, we gotta talk about this. Plot holes used to be this thing that only existed in super nerdy movie conversations. Like, hey, how did Indiana Jones survive clinging to the outside of that submarine? But over the past 15 years, they've become pervasive, spreading through online movie conversations. Everywhere you turn, people are complaining about Biggest plot holes. Plot holes. Plot holes. Plot holes. Plot holes. All the plot holes. Plot holes. Plot holes. So full of plot holes. Plot holes. Naruto plot holes. So many plot holes. Plot holes. And movie plot holes. Back in April, when A Quiet Place opened, my Twitter and Facebook feeds were filled with people complaining about all the plot holes. I saw one guy say he'd made a list of 41 plot holes in that movie. But here's the thing. No one seems to actually know what a plot hole is. And all those plot holes people complain about, they don't actually matter. So, what is a plot hole? People's definitions vary, but here's the generally accepted one that I use. A plot hole is a point in which a story breaks a previously established rule about its own universe. Basically, it's when a story contradicts itself. Okay, so here's what are not plot holes. Dark Knight Rises, we never see how Batman gets back to Gotham City. That's a plot hole. <sighs> One of the earliest cinematic developments was the concept of montage. The idea is that when two images are presented in sequence, the audience understands that they occur chronologically and will mentally fill in the time between scenes. So for instance, if a person is in one location and the next scene they're in another location, we understand that in between scenes, they traveled between the locations. Movies tend to assume that the audience is reasonably intelligent but I guess they're wrong. If movies showed us every single second that happened during the span of the story, they would be 40 hours long and really f***ing boring. There are so many plot holes in A Quiet Place. Oh, it's such a great movie. I mean, like, why did they decide to have a baby? And why didn't they just move to the waterfall? Oh, this is the one that really drives me nuts. Movies are, for the most part, about human beings, or at least characters who think and act like human beings. And you know what human beings are not? Logical. People are impulsive. They make choices based on emotion. Not everyone thinks exactly the same. And also, people make mistakes. You know how in Star Trek, Vulcans live dominated by logic, and it's established that acting logically is at odds with acting human. So if everyone acted totally logically all the time, only making the most logical decision in any situation, no one would be acting human. Thus, there would be no conflict, which would lead to no drama, which would lead to no stories. And movies would be really f***ing boring. There is a huge plot hole in Star Wars. I mean, come on. Why would the Death Star have such an obvious design flaw? Oh. Okay, some of these can be valid complaints. Sometimes there's a story development that's a little too convenient. Like in the 2009 Star Trek, Kirk just happens to get stranded on the same planet as old Spock, and they end up in the same cave together so Spock can explain what's going on. I like the movie, but that's a little contrived and lazy. But it's not a plot hole. I mean, how does Benicio Del Toro know the Rebels' plans? Nobody told him. That's a plot hole. Oh. <laughs> Uh. At least 50% of the plot holes that I see people complain about are things that are actually explained in the movie if you just pay attention. Like that one in The Last Jedi, there's a scene where you see DJ listening as Poe tells Finn and Rose the Resistance's plan. But I guess if you're too busy live tweeting about plot holes, you can miss some stuff. If you want, you can find plot holes anywhere. They're all over your favorite movies. In Lord of the Rings, the Eagles could have just flown the ring to Mount Doom and saved everyone all that trouble. In Toy Story, why does Buzz freeze like the other toys when he thinks he's a real person? In Ocean's Eleven, how did they get the flyers into the vault? In Cinderella, why does the glass slipper stay when everything else disappears? In Alien, if the acid can melt through the floor, why doesn't it melt through the entire ship? In Gremlins, what does After Midnight technically mean? Isn't it always After Midnight? How does that rule make any sense? In Star Wars, why does the Death Star have a trash compactor when they can just jettison the trash into space. Look, if you want to watch stuff this way, you can even find plot holes in this video. Why am I wearing sunglasses if I'm inside? I'm indoors in one shot and outdoors in the next, but we never see me go outside. Plot hole. You can find plot holes or logic gaps in any movie. And if you want to, go right ahead. Just don't tell me that those are genuine flaws and problems and reasons that a movie is bad. Because they're not. None of these things actually matter because they're not what a movie is about. So even though most people are using the term plot hole incorrectly, all of these complaints are rooted in the same thing.
But movies aren't about logic. They're not equations, they're not proofs, they're not puzzles. Movies are not math. Remember that guy in your freshman dorm who would always try to guess the endings of movies so that he could prove that he was smarter than the people who made them? Well now, everyone is turning into that guy. On the site MoviePlotHoles.com, there are seven plot holes listed for Die Hard. The first one says that the villain's plan is to stage a hostage situation so that the police will shut down power to the building, allowing them to access the vault. But since they would have already had detailed plans of the building, they could have just shut down power themselves, making the whole thing more simple. Now, I know it seems impossible to watch movies wrong, but you're watching movies wrong. Die Hard is a movie about an ordinary man thrown into an impossible situation, who needs to rise to the occasion and persevere so that he can reunite with his estranged wife. That's the point of the movie. That's what it's about. Most of the other plot holes for Die Hard listed on the site are variations on, why didn't John McClane do this? Well, because the whole point of John McClane is that he's a normal guy who makes human mistakes. If he did the perfect, most logical thing every single time, he wouldn't be the same character. He'd basically be a Vulcan, and the movie would end way earlier and be terrible. Take Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. At the climax of the story, Harry reaches the Triwizard Cup, which turns out to have been turned into a port key that transports him to Voldemort. So the villain's whole plan hinged on Harry being the one to get to the cup first and win the tournament. But really, any random object could have been turned into a port key, and they could have sent him to Voldemort way earlier without all that hassle. But that doesn't matter. We're so invested in Harry trying to figure out a way to win, and then so surprised by the reveal of the port key and Voldemort returning, that to pick apart the logic of the villain's plan would mean totally disengaging from the story. This, like so many plot holes, are things that would just destroy any conflict or drama and end the story immediately. Like, sure, to an objective, omniscient viewer, it would make logical sense for Admiral Haldo to tell Poe Dameron her plan. And then there would be no conflict and no drama. Poe would never send Finn on a mission, and Finn would never grow, and Poe would never grow, and there would be no story. And also, Haldo explains why she doesn't tell him the plan, she doesn't trust him, he just f***ed up and got demoted, she has no reason to. Again, if you think this is a plot hole, or you're annoyed because of the logic here, you're kinda watching movies wrong. There's an episode of the show Community that imagined what a horror movie would look like if all the characters only made totally logical decisions. Should we go check it out? No. We should call 911 on my fully charged cell phone, lock the doors, and then stand back to back in the middle of the room holding knives. And the conclusion is that it would be really boring. I am in no way telling you to turn your brain off or to not think critically about movies. Not at all. I'm saying you should worry about the things that actually matter. So take Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. I think it's a bad movie, and it has big old dumb logic issues. Like, why can Superman locate Lois Lane from her heartbeat, but can't find his mother the same way? Why doesn't Wonder Woman, who isn't affected by kryptonite, be the one to use the spear against Doomsday? But those aren't the real problems with the movie. The actual problems are that many of the central characters are totally static and poorly motivated, and they don't learn anything or grow through the story, and the one major moment of growth is caused by a ridiculous plot contrivance. So as much as I enjoy making fun of some dumb logic gaps in that movie, they still don't really matter. The plot holes, remember the plot holes? So you're trying to tell me the supremacy, Snoke's ship, isn't powerful enough to penetrate the shields. In episode 2F09, when Ichi plays Scratchy's skeleton like a xylophone, he strikes the same rib twice in succession, yet he produces two clearly different tones. Why is it that in the 80s or 90s or early 2000s, no one really cared about plot holes? They still existed, but no one ever complained a movie was bad because of all the plot holes. So what happened? Basically, the internet. Because I like driving myself insane, I searched back through Google year by year for references to plot holes. Until about 2007, they only appeared in movie reviews and forum posts. They hadn't gone fully mainstream yet. They hadn't been embraced by the public. But then in 2008, Cracked published the article Eight Classic Movies That Got Away With Gaping Plot Holes. There were more forum posts. Then in 2009, the TV Tropes page for Plot Hole was created. In 2010, it really began. Articles on Wired, The Escapist, Den of Geek, and Kotaku. Plot holes had officially crossed over into mainstream nerd culture. Their rise coincided with the arrival of listicle articles, and plot holes were the perfect clickbait. Nitpicks about popular things that could reveal things readers may have missed. But 2012 was where the change really happened. This was when plot holes started taking over YouTube. Pop culture commentary from a nerdy fan perspective began exploding in popularity. 
and immediately, the types of videos that proved most popular were humorous analyses of popular movies focusing on surface level nitpicks. And over the next several years, these types of videos grew in number and popularity. For many people, especially millennials and whatever the generation after millennials is called, most film criticism they consume is on YouTube. And not all, but a lot of this is surface level critique, focusing on nitpicks and chief among those nitpicks, plot holes. Plot holes don't really mean anything, but they're good clickbait. And those videos get views, and they multiply. And people watch them and believe them and repeat those points in conversation. And when they watch movies, they think about these surface level nitpicks. They look for them. No one is really to blame for this. Okay, CinemaSins definitely deserves some of the blame. But it's not just them. This is way bigger. This is about cultural shifts coinciding with evolving technology. And look, as long as movies are popular and people on the internet are making videos for clicks, it's going to keep happening. So look, watch whatever YouTube videos you want, think whatever you want about movies, just please. Was the punching too aggressive? Maybe a bit? Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. This is a video I've wanted to make for a long time because clearly I have a lot of feelings about the subject. And I want to thank Sennheiser for making this possible. They sent me over their G4 wireless microphone system to try out for a video, and I used it for the entire thing. I'm using it right now. I have the lav mic attached to me right now, which is uh, connected to the transmitter, which broadcasts to the receiver, connected to the audio recorder. And this whole thing has been extremely easy to use. I've wanted to get a wireless mic set for a while now, and this is everything I ever wanted in one. It's really easy to use, and the sound is great. And uh, since this video involved a bunch of walking and talking, a lot of moving around, this really helped us shoot faster and freed us up to just move around more. I'm not being paid to say this, Sennheiser just sent me the product to try out, and I genuinely love it. I'll be using this a lot from here on out. If you are a filmmaker who is in need of a wireless microphone setup, I would recommend this thing. This is like the best I've encountered. So Sennheiser, thank you for hooking me up. And the second thing I want to say is that this is our first video ever with a totally original score. It's all composed and recorded by my friend Brian Hose, who's the composer for the hit off-Broadway play Puffs, which is running right now. And Brian did an incredible job. Like, I love this music in very little time because he is ridiculously talented, and we will absolutely be working together on future projects. Uh, his info is in the description, so go check out his music. If you're a filmmaker, uh, I would hire him now before he gets crazy expensive. And Brian, again, thank you. Okay, and all the usual stuff, merch is available. Listen to our podcast, We Hard Heart Net. Check out the Patreon if you want to help support this channel and help us make bigger and cooler stuff. Follow me on all the social media links, and we'll be back here very soon with another new video. See you then.